This is Broadcast Beat Magazine with Ryan Salazar. Ryan Salazar here with Broadcast Beat Magazine. We have a very special guest, the music director of Ricky and the Flash, the movie. How you doing, Neil Citrin? I am good, Ryan. Thank you. How about you? Good? Doing excellent, sir. So uh, I saw the movie on opening night, was absolutely blown away by the music in the uh, movie. Tell us a little bit about the project and, and yourself. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Um, the project started uh, in in uh, July for me of last year, and uh, Jonathan Demi was doing auditions for the male counterpart to Merrill, and I was brought in to play guitar to help do the auditions. And while I was there, I noticed that Merrill was sort of playing, I call it like if you're taught Spanish, proper Spanish, not street Spanish. So she was playing guitar, but it was very stiff. So I was looking at her sort of confused, and Jonathan Demi asked me, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm shocked that she's playing this way instead of that way. She's supposed to be playing for 40 years. So I got a chance to fix her hand up and fix her up for two days, and then it went really well, so then they hired me to teach her. And then they also asked me and Mark Wolfson uh, to record it live, and uh, that turned into a whole, <laughs> you know, a six-month thing. Um and uh, and interestingly enough, for you know, for all your recording guys out there, he Jonathan Demi had had two requests. He wanted it every shot to be recorded live. We were not doing playback. We're not doing lip syncing. It had to be on stage live. And the other thing is because it's supposed to be a shitty club in Tarzana, you have no mics on the amps. You have no mics on the drums. You have no nothing. And so we had to use triggers for the drums and use direct boxes on the guitars and bass and. Uh, the the weirdest thing we did was when we were at this bar practicing, which is called the Rodeo Bar, I found a broken oar that was about this long, and we taped the overhead mics to it and shoved it up into the lighting, and it was hidden, and we could get overheads. <laughs> so, so otherwise, we'd have no cymbals. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Tell us a little bit about some of the gear you guys used. Everybody in, the, in our business, uh, whether it's music or it's uh, audio somehow or, or video is a gearhead. So, uh, and we all love physical gear, not just software too. So tell us a little bit about some of the stuff behind you or, or potentially what you used in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll tell everybody about my new find, which is pretty cool. And I pulled it here for the interview. This is a Radial Engineering JDX. It's a direct box, but uh, what's happening is in these days is, you know, you if for live, you put a direct box on a bass, it's okay, the bass sounds great, but on guitar, it's just got awful. This has a speaker emulator in it, and so the sound of your amp really gets reproduced through this box, and you can put it right through the PA, and it's brilliant. So for us, we were trying to, you know, like, like any engineer, the first thing you do is you try to put a mic in the back of the open back of the Fender amps, and it's got awful. It's like this. So we, I got turned on to these direct boxes, and they were brilliant. They saved our butts. And so uh, the bass, we use just a regular direct box. But for the two guitars for Merrill and Rick Springfield, we use these. And uh, I did use do some reamping later, but most of it is the sound of these boxes. It was super great. Um, for drum triggers, we used uh, um, some drum triggers that the guy who ran, uh, Phil Garfinkel, who ran the live sound through the Presonus PA, He's a Personas rep, and he came and, and did the PA for us. Uh, and he's also a live sound mixer. He had some uh, um, uh, chips and stuff and out of box. And we, the best, one of the nicest things he brought was a, a uh, uh, Anthony Di Maria Labs 600 mic pre. So we had a really good mic pre on Merrill's voice and Rick's voice for the recordings. Um, and he had drum triggers. And Joe, the drummer, had drum triggers in some of his drums, not in all of them. So it was kind of a combination of everybody pulling their gear together to, to get that sound. We sampled Joe's drums prior to the recording so that I could put those his samples on his trigger you know, action so that it would sound like Joe and not just some generic drummer's drums. Um, something might be fun. I don't know if you can see it. My uh, 176 compressor, I use that on Merrill's voice, which is... A, uh, a tube version of an 1176. It's sort of the predecessor, and it's smoking good. Uh, it really gives a thickness and warmth to a voice. And uh, the the thing about the backside, what we what I did here in my room, as opposed to what we captured, 
we only wanted to not make it not live. It was live. Every every take was them playing. We just wanted to smooth it out a little bit so that if it was, you know, we had some, sometimes uh, Rick Springfield would stomp on the floor and you'd actually hear that through his amp and stuff. So we, we just sort of smooth stuff out. But uh, we didn't use too much too much gear other than compressors to just smooth it out, a some EQ, a some reverbs, but not much. So did you have the freedom uh, to, to actually pick music for the movie? No, I no. Jonathan Demi did all that, and the the uh, thing that's kind of interesting is that American Girl, the first song in the film, is also the film in Silence of the Lambs <laughs> when the guy gets the girl in the van. That was Jonathan's little, you know, use the song again and see if somebody if people figured it out. It's, it's creepy, <laughs> but Jonathan Demi is a way big music guy. This was a film done with Gary Getzman, who's a, who was the producer and is unbelievable music guy. Uh, a Jonathan Demi, who knows about people that I've never even heard of in my whole life, and he's so efficient at knowing bands and stuff and styles, and a Mark Wilson, who's also that way. So we had so much freedom to do our own arrangements. So those, so I arranged the songs the way they are now in the film. Uh, American Girl was pretty straight ahead because they wanted it like Petty's version, but some of the other things we had some freedom to play with. My favorite song in the whole movie, and I can't remember what the name of it is, but was really the, the theme song of the movie. It was just so smooth. And, and, and Meryl sounded, she sounded great. Yeah, a cold one. It was written by a, guy, a kid named Jonathan, and I forgot his last name. He's going to kill me. And uh, Jenny Lewis. Okay. Um, the, one of the fun things I got to do, just to give you an idea how what a quick study Meryl is, she had to play the, that song acoustically in a house scene besides playing it electric with the band. So I grabbed the guitar from her acoustic and I started padding it this way instead of strumming it because she's a 40 year old veteran of guitar playing. I thought she'd maybe do something different. She filmed it on her phone. I came in the next day and she was totally doing it. <laughs> it was like, she's just faster than fast. A really, really good musician. I'm noticing on your website, neilcitron.com, and, and I wanted to bring up some other stuff while we had you, but um, you've got a lot of experience with a lot of folks. It, it looks like you did a similar thing with Tom Hanks, right? Right, yeah, that was the first film I did with uh, Gary Getzman, who's Tom's partner, um, That Thing You Do, and the label of the ba that the band was on, Playtone, became a real thing. That's where Playtone's name came from, was from that movie that Tom Hanks wrote. And that was a that was a lot of fun. It was, you know, my I did a few locations, CBS and a church that's very well known on Highland and Fa and uh, Franklin for the uh, um, for a band contest. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I taught uh, Steve Zahn first, and then I got uh, Jonathan Sheck, the lead singer, and then I was the only one on stage helping them. So Tom would go, "I got it, I got it." Gary would turn to me, "Well," and I'd say, "Yeah, two thumbs up," and they'd move on. I always had the thing for analog, the warm, the fuzzy, you know, feels all good inside because because it's got that warmth of analog. I assume you're the, you're an analog guy, too. I'm seeing all that 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 smoking hot gear behind you. Yes, I'm totally analog, uh, analog head. I learned uh, at Cherokee Recording Studios this was the first place I ever worked. And they had a Trident A range. That was sort of my first introduction. I, I sort of got to help out with the Cars first record with uh, uh, with uh, um, the the boys that owned Cherokee were very nice to me, uh, the Rob brothers. And Bruce Rob took me under his wing, and he would say, "Hey, they need a mic in there. We here, go take this." And I'd put a fifty-seven on an amp for somebody, and um, it was really fun. I worked on that, and Infinity by Journey and Foreigner Head Games were that one summer, and I was there and sort of got to watch and help, and that's sort of where I got the bug for recording. Well, after you're around that kind of stuff. Digital recording is brilliant in a lot of ways, but it's a facsimile of the analog that I grew up on. So any chance that I had, I would try and pick up analog pieces of gear till here it is years later and I've got all the gear that I ever wanted. It was really great. So uh, when I mix, even though it's in a DAW because you have to do editing and stuff and that's how it's recorded, it comes out into the analog world and it doesn't go back in. I stay in the analog world till it's done. Pro Tools, for example, with all the plugins that they've got from Waves and and you yeah, know yeah. all these different manufacturers, it's amazing the the features that they've got. But it, you know, when I was an audio guy, it felt so good to just touch that gear and turn the knobs and feel like you were really in control of everything. You know? 
You know, it, it's fabulous. And it's really funny. I mean, if you wanted to just change a compressor in person, you just put your hands on the knob and roll it. You're done. In the plug-in, you got to open up the plug-in. You got to take your mouse. You got to find the little thing and you got to kind of slide it up unless you have a controller. Then your controller has to be a Pro Tools controller or a controller for whatever software you're using specific. It gets pretty complicated. It's just much easier to just reach out and turn a knob. And it looks like you had some involvement with My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the movie? I, I did. Um, Mark Wolfson and I were uh, asked to put together the soundtrack because the writer, he only had a little piece of music called The Bridge Kiss, and he had another little piece called uh, The Door Opening and whatever. And we figured out how to actually make it be songs enough to be a soundtrack. So it was, that was uh, challenging but fun, really fun. How did you get started in this whole business anyways? Uh, I'm a rock guitar player who had a deal when I was a teenager and didn't make it. And uh, so when you start doing records, demos to try and get your second deal, I kept paying guys to ruin my band. I figured I could just ruin it myself. I didn't have to pay somebody to do it. So that's sort of how I got involved in trying to learn how to engineer. Uh, I was lucky enough to have two very famous friends. One is Greg Ladani, who unfortunately passed away, but he did Jackson Brown for years and Toto. And the other one is Dusty Wakeman, who was Dwight Yoakam's engineer, and he's and and uh, a guy named Lauderdale and a uh, um, bunch of uh, uh, Lucinda Williams, a bunch of stuff. So uh, those guys taught me a lot about recording live instruments. So it was really fun. This one's really cool. I was chatting with a uh, with some folks and heard that you had some involvement with Michael Jackson at one point. I did. I got asked to mix a, a, an album called Michael Jackson Stripped Mixes, and it was all the old stuff when he was. 10, 11, 12 years old, ABC, and I'll Be There. I'll Be There was used for an all-state commercial, and it's, but we stripped everything out. We took drums out, and, and all there is is congas, the family singing backgrounds. Uh, it was pretty fun to actually pull up a fader and hear Michael Jackson singing. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it was really fun. Um, and uh, we finished it two weeks before Michael passed away, and then put into the process, and then Michael passed away. And then it came out two weeks after he passed. So it was kind of bad timing, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it was a great project. It was really fun to do. It's so odd, you know, I'm, uh, from Steve Vai to Michael Jackson, it was kind of kind of a big turn. But it was fun. Thanks, Neil. It was really awesome spending some time with you this afternoon at Broadcast Beat. Uh, and it's an honor to have you on our show. Thank you very much. And me and my Telecaster, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. <laughs>